You know, this hour just quiet is so important in a world where the noise is so intense that it rattles our minds, our hearts, you know, our bodies, everything, and keeps us, you know, totally being distracted from the single most important things we really have to do, which is to stay centered inside, open, and even during the day to draw Shakti, to draw energy. And I think having an hour like this that connects us to a really deep silence, connects us to something profoundly spiritual that nurtures us inside and really brings about a whole different way of seeing the world. A world that's really full of peace, that's full of love, that has a whole different purpose than all that noise that rattles around and, you know, and really makes everybody crazy. So we have something here, I think, that we need to be grateful for. That this goes on. I know I'm grateful for it, that this goes on and people benefit from it. And hopefully it's doing something to truly not only change my life, but to change you know, the life of every person that's sitting in these classes, getting them more in touch with the higher force of energy in the universe, teaching us all how to live with open hearts, with love, with compassion for other people, being non judgmental, teaching us how to do it because we really have to learn how to do it. It doesn't just happen that we live that way. We have to learn how to build an inner life that enables us to live that way. Does anyone have a question? I have a question, Stuart. Yes. Chris. <clears throat> Stuart, um, every now and then, words come like mantras to me that I hear. And I'm wondering if that's an okay thing to happen in our classes. It's, yeah, it's see just fine, Chris, you know, okay. just yeah. do them quietly in yourself and don't start singing them to everybody in the room. <laughs> I mean it. There's nothing wrong with those mantras. They get you quiet. They get you a little more open, mm -hmm. you know, and also make sure that they don't get you stoned because part of, chanting mantras and temples as everybody kind of gets blissed out and then they got to leave and deal with life and I can't tell you how many people have asked me that kind of thing about how they would sit and meditate for four hours a day and when they would leave their apartment they would completely freak out mm -hmm. part of the meditation was chanting mantras it was a kind of transcendental meditation that I don't know if people still do it, but it was very popular when I was younger. And I had people would ask me, why is it when I leave, everything outside freaks me out? You know, because they get blissed out and then they step into all that tension and, you know, of the world and it, they don't have the system to deal with it. Yeah. So no, there's nothing, I use little mantras too, you know, I really do. and. But, but they have to take me deeper into the third chakra and get me mm -hmm. more grounded and get my heart more open and build a system inside that is strong enough so that when I leave my apartment, I don't freak out. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Okay. I don't want to freak out because the rest of the world is freaked out. You know? Yeah. I mean, I watched that uh, town hall. I wanted to find out who this person was. I mean, it could freak you out listening to people and what they talk about. And they're going to be president of the United States. And God bless, you know? Yeah. Got to be really strong to live today and to live in peace with yourself and in peace with the world. You have to have such a profound connection with higher energy that it brings about an inner peace that can't be disturbed by all the bullshit 
that goes on in life. And there sure is enough of it, you know? Yeah. That's that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. And nothing wrong with chanting a little mantra, Chris, but just do it quietly in yourself. I mean, you can Om Namah Shabbat it, you can Sri Ram it, you can whatever you want to do. You know, there's a whole litany of mantras. Or you can make up your own that works. I, I, don't, I usually make up little things in myself that really get me open. Yeah. And I think it's very important to do. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have a question they would like to? I mean, in Rudy's meditation group, there was only one rule, honestly, no dope, no drugs, no hallucinogenics. He caught you doing hallucinogenics, and he would ask you to leave. And I remember walking across the SMU campus in Dallas, you know, with him, where we were down there with Muktananda, and there was a lot of chanting going on. And he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, I'd rather smoke dope and chant. <laughs> and that was the one thing forbidden in his, you know, meditation group. <laughs> dope. So I said, Rudy, what are you talking? He said, look, at least if you smoke dope, you know you're getting stoned. <laughs> if you chant, you're getting stoned. You know? Anyway, it, it stayed with me because, you know, he has such a great sense of humor about everything, you know. I mean, we're driving in a car. We're driving in a car with Muktananda was sitting in the front seat and everybody became vegetarians and celibates. And we, that whole Hindu trip was laid on everybody in Rudy's ashram, you know? And Rudy was riding him. We were riding to a place called the World of Animals. And you'd be driving on a car and a lion would walk past or a, you know, an elephant. And Rudy, a lion came past. And one of Muktananda's things was you can't eat meat because, uh, you know, cows eat vegetables. So why should we eat cows? So Rudy saw a lion and said, Baba, I'm going to have a lion steak tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy had such a way of just everything, turning around everything and just making it into tongue in cheek. And it's real. I used to love it. I mean, it used to just crack me up, the things he would say. <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget, he, I was working, I'm telling stories here, but they're great. I was working uh, for a guy in one of Rudy's buildings, renovating his space to make a photography studio out of it, a gallery. And this guy was a pretty famous photographer. And I, I was scraping beams and I looked like a freaking coal miner, you know, I, I was covered with just soot. And, and Rudy came down, and we were talking there and he, Never forget, he said, you know, Muktananda, uh, I, I, I declare that I'm a celibate to Muktananda. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I guess we all have, you know. And he said, yeah, but it doesn't mean I can't give somebody else an orgasm. <laughs> and he just, <laughs> his way of looking at life was so extraordinary and finding the humor in all of these situations, you know, it was so extraordinary. I mean, he just... Turn all this orthodoxy and all this ritual into just bullshit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and being able to see the world that way was such an extraordinary teacher for me, you know? <laughs> and it always was a good laugh. It was really a good laugh. And I remember those things because, you know, who would ever think out of your guru yeah. you would hear something like that, you know? <laughs> This extraordinary being who basically saved my life, you know, and taught me how to literally do what I'm doing today, saying things. I, it, it, it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, I'm telling you. An extraordinary way of looking at the world and finding the humor in everything. And, yeah. Not be intimidated by anything, you know, and finding it's just all silly, you know.
Anyway, I don't know how I got into this, but does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Yes, it is. It's all bullshit. And if you do your inner work, you build a chakra system, and you see what is real. You develop a third eye that enables you to look out at the world and see what is real, what is an illusion. And you can live in life with your tongue in cheek. And just, you know, get the humor out of everything instead of taking everything so seriously and driving yourself crazy. You know? Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? And I remember Rudy, <laughs> he, he, there was a guy there named Carl Collins. Carl Collins came from this fabulously <clears throat> wealthy Texas family that owned insurance companies. And, and he was very close to Rudy. And he came to New York when Muktananda was there. And he invited Muktananda and Rudy and a whole coterie of people to come to Texas to stay at the, da the Dallas Hilton and do satsangs and you know, bring this whole thing to Texas. And I remember I'm, I'm standing, I look like a coal miner for God's sake. I was covered in soot, I was covered in dirt. And Rudy said, I want you to come to Texas with me. I said, I want you to come around the corner and meet Carl Collins. <laughs> I said, Rudy, like this? He said, yes, come if he can't see you know, the spiritual nature of your inner being when you're like this, forget about him, you know? Anyway, I went around there and I made, like, talking to Carl Collins, a very rich guy, and he, you know, and uh, and he, and Rudy said, I want Stuart to come to Texas. And Carl said, great, you know, I'll get a ticket for him also. And I'm standing, I really look like a, like an untouchable in India. <laughs> exactly how I looked. <laughs> Covered with soot and dirt, and you know, you know and yeah, we'll get him a ticket. And going to India, going to Texas, really, in many ways, saved my life. It really saved my life. It was such an important trip for me because it gave me such a deep insight into who my spiritual teacher was, and the the ability to be politically correct and tell somebody who was trying to rip me away from Rudy, no, you are not my teacher. Whereas the whole ashram was telling him, yes, you are my teacher. It was amazing, you know? It was an amazing week that I spent there. And it also started an ashram that became very important in my life in Denton, Texas, you know? Does anyone else ever say, so, you know, you never know what's going to work. You got to be open and, you know, and just, I mean, Rudy said to me, I'm going to, you know, I want to live in the Middle East. Are your bags packed? Are you ready to go? He said, of course, wherever you are, you know, this is where my spiritual life is. I will go. You want to go to the moon and start an ashram? I'll go to the moon. <laughs> if you it's like I said to Chris one day, you know, Chris, how would you like to go to Kathmandu? I called her up. <laughs> Over the phone, she said yes. <laughs> Just <laughs> went there. It gave her her life. It was an extraordinary thing that happened to her there. Yes. Was most people, I got to think about it. I got this. I got that. I got the other. Can I? Do I? I said, well, you want to go to Kathmandu and run an ashram? I want to start an ashram in Kathmandu. She said, okay. And we had, you know, I went there. There were like 80 people came to class. I, you know, I'll never forget going, landing on that plane in the Kathmandu airport, stepping onto the runway. And there was a crowd there like I'd never seen in my life. Every one of them had a mala putting her on my neck. I had malas. <laughs> I finally had to start giving them back to people. I mean, I'll never forget that. It was one of the most extraordinary things. It gave me a good laugh.
You know, Guruji is here. Sure. You know. <laughs> anyway, enough. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you. God bless you all for this hour of sanity here, peace of inner quiet of a connection with God, and that all of us can share in this. I think. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless you too. Meditation class on Sunday. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Most